It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, question to the Premier. This Premier likes to claim that he's for the little guy. But the littlest people in this province will pay the biggest price yep. if he keeps up his attack on education workers. Yep. Our kids count on caring adults in the classroom, and this government is going to drive them out the door permanently. Yep. That will mean less support for kids with disabilities, less support for the youngest students, and less safe schools. If the Premier won't rip up his anti-worker legislation for the sake of kids, parents, education workers, will he do it to salvage his so-called brand? To reply, the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's nice to see the opposition's changing the message. They're actually worried about kids because they're worried about the unions yesterday and the day before and the day, day before. But from the beginning, Mr. Speaker, Order. I've been very clear that we will do whatever it takes to keep Ontario's two million students Order. in the class. Yeah. We will do whatever it takes to give students and parents certainty. After two years of pandem to pandemic disruptions, enough is enough. We need kids in the classroom learning. This is about their mental, emotional, physical well-being of two million students and therefore the respective families after two very difficult years brought on by the pandemic. Unfortunately, Order. Mr. Speaker, QP refuses, and I, they absolutely Response. refuse to withdraw their strike action. They refuse to back down from shutting down schools. Mr. Speaker, QP has left us no sure. choice but to use legislation to ensure stability. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Actually, the Premier does have a choice. Yeah. He could make a good offer. He could make a difference in the lives of our children and our education workers. <laughs> Speaker, the Premier says that education workers are little guys too, little gals. This government thinks it's okay for them to have to use food banks. Yep. The Premier is acting like a bad boss. Yep. When bad bosses disrespect and underpay people for long enough, those people quit. They walk. Yeah. It won't by, be just Friday or next week that parents have to worry about if education workers leave the profession. Yeah. It's the future of their kids' education. Yeah. Yeah. If the Premier won't rip up his anti-worker legislation for the sake of kids, parents, and education workers, will he do it to avoid getting booed in public again yeah. for acting like a bad boss? Premier? You know, we live in a democracy. People spoke June 2nd very loud. And that's why they lost seats, they lost seats, and we filled the seats. Mr. Speaker, we will always, always support the frontline workers. Come to order. Our, offer, order. our offer includes an increased wages, the order. largest in the entire country, Mr. Speaker, and maintains the most generous pension and benefit plan, again, in the entire country, including 131 paid sick order. days. The fact the is, QP demanded a nearly 50 per cent increase yep. and threatened a strike if they didn't get it. They have left us no other choice. The official Speaker. opposition will come to order. The Premier, please reply. They have left us with no other choice but to proceed with legislation. For the sake of Ontario's two million students and their parents, schools must remain open. Mr. Speaker, we're using every tool at our disposal to make sure Fonts. kids are in class full-time where they need and deserve to be. Mr. Speaker, we are investing $26.6 billion in Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, again to the Premier. Before the election, this government went on a so-called charm offensive to court workers. Most workers saw through this government. They remembered when his government cancelled the minimum wage increase and took away paid sick days. Yep. After the election, now workers know without a doubt that this government is not really interested in them. The second this government got what it wanted, it lost the workers' phone number. 
and it lost direction to the bargaining table. Yep. If the Premier won't rip up his anti-worker legislation for the sake of kids, parents and education workers, will he do it to stop embarrassing his own Labour Minister? The Premier. Mr. Speaker, we're investing more than $26.6 billion in public education this year, the single largest investment in Ontario's history. Here, here. Of that $26.6 billion that our government is spending on public education, 80 per cent of that $26.6 billion Order. goes solely towards paying salaries. Wow. Education funding for this school year is $2 billion more than the final year of the NDP and the Liberals' rule. Our focus is on mental and emotional and physical health of Ontario's 2 million students and their Order. families. The students have had enough. The parents have had enough. The NDP and Liberal can't have it both ways. They either stand with the students or parents, or they support shutting down schools, and they support shutting down schools, keeping, keeping the kids at home, and a million parents wondering what to do. It strikes their students. And the PC party is the only party that's standing there. Senior, please take a seat. Stop the clock. The member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. The member for Sudbury will come to order. The member for Davenport will come to order. The member for Windsor West will come to order. The member for Toronto St. Paul's will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Questions for the Premier. Speaker, Bill 27 evokes the notwithstanding clause to violate sections of the Canadian Charter, rights and freedoms, and the Human Rights Code, and that is a disgrace. The Premier insists there's no other option. I disagree. It doesn't have to be this way. The Conservative government doesn't have to stop kids from going to school on Friday. There are more options. For example, Speaker, the minister continued negotiating. CUBA came back to the table yesterday with substantial changes. Yep. The minister could offer to extend the deadline and continue to bargain. Yep. The minister could offer binding arbitration. Yes. Yep. My question, if the Premier is dedicated to keeping kids in class, why not use all the options? Has the Premier Speaker directed the Minister to use binding arbitration to offer to continue bargaining beyond the deadline? And if not, then why is the Premier choosing to force this strike? Yeah, yeah. To reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we insist that kids are in class. We believe we are here because QP has decided on Sunday to put this province on a strike footing for Friday, and that is unacceptable. These kids have paid enough of a price of the pandemic and the recent strikes just three years ago. After not Order. securing a nearly 50% increase in compensation, they've decided to strike. And Mr. Speaker, Davenport will come because to they have with they have refused to withdraw their strike. This government has no choice but to move forward with a bill that will provide stability for children. Mr. Speaker, this legislation before the House will Order. provide stability that every child in this province deserves. If members continue to ignore my request to come to order, I will warn them, and if they continue to persist to ignore the Speaker, they will be named. Member for Sudbury. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Another question for the Premier. Li uh, library technicians love their work, and they told me that they absolutely do not want to strike. They suffer every time they are away from their work and the children that they support. Their work is difficult and complex and they are very invested in the work. They say that the joy of their work makes them happy. Is the government prepared to negotiate a fair agreement so that workers like Texi and other library technicians can continue to work? and do the job that they love so much. Answer. That a resident from Severn, Ontario, from Simcoe North, wrote to us saying she said that her and her husband, like many Canadians, are hurting financially right now. Unlike the education unions, they're not guaranteed uh, salary increases, benefits, pensions, or job security. She urged the government to get this bill through the House to provide stability for her children. Mr. Speaker, we have an obligation to keep kids in the classroom, and I urge the members opposite to stand up for kids and work with this government to keep kids in class where they belong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Sudbury, come to order. 
supplementary. And Mr. Ottawa West to PM. Thank you, Speaker. You don't avert a strike by refusing to negotiate. That's right. You avert a strike by bargaining a deal. But this week, the minister has stubbornly refused to negotiate. Yesterday, the government rejected a new proposal from CUPE that could have ended this whole situation. The government has failed to ask for binding arbitration. The Premier claims they're doing all they can for our kids. So why, when there are so many other things the government could have done this week, have they virtually guaranteed schools will be disrupted tomorrow? The Minister of Education. M Mr. Speaker, we never walked away from the negotiating table, but the union is walking away from 2 million children this Friday, and it is unacceptable. And the government is. Member for Davenport will come to order. The member for Windsor West will come to order. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, this government has never walked away from the negotiating table. QP has decided to walk away from kids on Friday on a path to a strike they always intended to deliver. It was only this summer, Speaker, before the government even tabled our first proposal that they announced a strike mandate. Why would they be on this path other than to frustrate the children, parents, and our entire economy? We need kids in school. Every parent knows this, and our government will deliver on a plan and a promise to provide stability for kids who have endured so much from this pandemic. I urge the members opposite to stand up for kids and vote for this bill. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is, in, is to the Premier. Speaker, this government is desperately trying to paint caring adults who work in our kids' schools as the bad guys. Everyone else knows they work hard and deserve their rights, fair wages and respect. James is a school custodian who writes, quote, I now barely earn enough to support myself, let alone help my mom, who's 75, also still working as a part-time custodian because she can't afford to retire. My school board job doesn't pay me enough to pay for the rising cost of living. My co-workers and I earn on average $39,000 and can't afford to live on that. We want our students to have the services they need in our public schools. I'm asking you to give us the improvements on wages and working conditions that I need and not support legislation that takes away our right to negotiate those improvements. End quote. What would this premier like to say to James? Minister of Education. We are committed to keeping kids in the classroom. That that is our obligation as a government, and we will fulfil it through this legislation before the House designed to put an end because, Mr. Speaker, we believe enough Order. is enough. The Premier is right. There is one party in this House who is standing up for kids on the backdrop of a never-ending strike in the province of Ontario. The opposition will come to order. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, you know, a rather serious matter is before the House. A bill is before us to ensure kids are in school, and I would not trivialize the impacts on working people in this province. Their kids deserve to be in school. Every child deserves to be in school, and I urge the members to have the courage of their convictions, stand up for their constituents, and vote for stability in the classroom. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you. And back to the Premier. And I am happy to stand in the courage of my convictions in opposition to this horrible government right now. But Erin is a frustrated education assistant, and she writes, quote, The schools are on fire. In all my years, I have never seen the challenges the schools and students are facing each day. We need to fight to ensure no more dedicated, effective workers leave their profession because they need to pay their bills. We need to fight to protect the students' rights to the proper resources and supports that they need to be successful in the classroom. We need to fight to ensure that the students get the education system they deserve. They should not have to pay privately for a proper education. All I want is a livable wage. I want resources and money to put into our education system so that our children, including my own, have the best chance at a positive and successful future. I want the government to respect us and our roles, and that is shown through true collective bargaining. The bully tactics the government is using is not only an attack on education workers, but on all unions." End quote. What on earth would this Premier like to say to Aaron? Mm -hmm. Minister of Education. 
we are we are grateful to Aaron and to every member who work in our schools. So much so, Speaker, that we have hired 7,000 more education workers in the province under the plan proposed before this House. 1,800 more education workers, 800 more educators will be hired. The largest investment in the province's history, 680 million more dollars this year compared to last year. That is an investment in public education. In addition, Speaker, to providing investments in our schools, we are increasing salaries every year, 10 percent over four years, maintaining a pension and the best, health benef the best health benefits, 131 days of sick leave, and absolute job security that many people watching could only dream of. Mr. Speaker, we want kids in the classroom. Order. We believe they have a right to learn, and we will stand up for their parents, the million parents who are deserved on this Member government for Oshawa, to get come the job order. done and provide stability for the people we all represent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaker. Next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. Good morning, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Associate Minister of Transportation. Speaker, while winter is fast approaching and more people are using public transit, their schedules are busy and they just want to get from point A to point B as conveniently as possible without any hassle. Unfortunately, after two decades of transit mismanagement and neglect by the previous Liberal government, our government inherited a transit system in the GTHA that pales in comparison to the ridership experiences of other jurisdictions. Speaker, through you, I'd like to ask the Associate Minister of Transportation what our government is doing to improve the ridership experience of my constituents, many of whom who travel from the Oakville GO station, which is the busiest transit station in the network outside of Union Station. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Oakville for the question and for his tireless work in advocating for transit in his riding. <laughs> Speaker, it's indeed true the Liberal government left Ontario unprepared for both today and tomorrow's transit needs. Fortunately, Speaker, this government is making the largest investment into public transit in Canadian history and bettering the rider experience all along. Speaker, on August 11th, our government began offering riders on GO, Brampton, My Way, and Oakville Transit the ability to pay their fares by tapping their credit cards on Presto readers. I'm glad to let the members know, Speaker, that the technology is working and that commuters are choosing this option because they've tapped over 255,000 times using credit cards on these four agencies since we launched in August. Speaker, enabling riders to simply tap with their credit cards is another example of how our government is bettering the transit experience, respecting taxpayers' money, and helping people get to where they need to go. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, again, and thank you to the Associate Minister for your response. I'm encouraged by this update, especially after the track record of the previous Liberal government, which decimated the quality of the transit system across the GTHA. Under their watch, promises of subway development were broken, transit investments were delayed, growing region transit needs were neglected, and they launched the Presto fare collection system that resulted in nearly half a billion dollars in cost overruns. Speaker, through you. I'd like to ask the Associate Minister of Transportation how our government is delivering on improved transit experience for my constituents and all the residents of the GTHA. Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, that's a very fair concern because after 15 years of zero action from the NDP and Liberal coalition, our transit system is simply not where it needs to be. Order. That's why our government is improving the rider experience and introducing an enhanced Presto system. In fact, Speaker, next year our government will further expand the new payment options across the entire GTHA with our next step to expand the credit card tap payment option across the 905, including Durham, York, Hamilton and Burlington. Yeah. Speaker, we're not going to stop until we connect the entire grid with these payment options, better experiences for riders so that they can go more conveniently from work, school, wherever they need to be. When you combine this with our Go Affordability Pilot, our youth and post-secondary student 40% discount, our elimination of double fares for riders in the 905, connecting to and from Go on their local transit, Speaker, Response. it's clear we're getting the job done, Speaker. We're not only delivering record transit investments, we're delivering a better experience all the way. Wow. Yeah. Next question, member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Education workers, a largely woman-led profession, are earning an average of $39,000 a year or less and often have to access food banks. Many need a second or third job to keep a roof over their heads. Speaker, I ask the Premier this. 
When will he actually put students first by investing in these low-wage education workers, the backbone of our schools, and stop undermining our public education? Rip up Bill 28. Minister of Education. I wish the member opposite would bring that energy and urge QP to rip up their strike tomorrow that's going to impact 2 million kids. Not once has the member from Windsor raised the concerns of children, and I find that Order. entirely reprehensible. Who are we here to serve if not the parents, the taxpayers, and the children, the next generation of our province, Speaker? Let's be clear. The average worker makes $27 an hour. In Toronto, it's north of 32. Mr. Speaker, 10 months on average a year, which makes a good point. Mr. Speaker, in addition, they have 131 days of paid sick leave. They have a pension that is indexed to inflation. They have health benefits for their entire family. They have job security. Not many of our constituents could say they have that deal. They make more in a school than in a college, in a hospital, in manufacturing, in transportation, in any sector of the economy. Spots. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to offering a fair deal, but we're also committed to standing up for kids, keep them in schools. Centre is warned. The member for Davenport is warned. The member for London North Centre is warned. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I wish the Minister of Education would put that much energy into actually bargaining a fair collective agreement with these people. <laughs> Speaker, I've heard from hundreds of education workers, ECEs, EAs, and others. They're sharing their stories about not being able to feed their children or working multiple jobs to barely scrape by. This government is pushing them to the brink and out of their profession. Explain to me how that is supporting students. Speaker, why is the Premier attacking workers, and why is he especially focused on women-led professions like nurses, health care workers, Bill 124 ring a bell, and education workers? Education. Mr. Speaker, in the words of a mother from Stittsville, she said, I'm truly counting on your government to get kids back in school where they belong. Tom from Whitby, a supply teacher, said, I can tell you not a single parent wants a strike. You guys are doing the right thing. Please stick to your guns. Mr. Speaker, a message for Tom and for every parent in this province. We hear them. We will stand up for them, and we're going to ensure these kids stay in school. Order. <laughs> Next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. My constituents in Oakville North Burlington are experiencing increased cost of living pressures due to high inflation, which is making life more challenging and less affordable for them. Many global factors are contributing to the economic challenges that people are facing day to day. On the news, my constituents hear about the geopolitical instability caused by Russia's brutal war on Ukraine. They see how the impacts rising prices in our stores and the disruption of our supply chains are having. Speaker, could the minister please provide this House with specifics about how our government plans to address our province's finances during this period of global economic uncertainty? The Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hard-working member from Oakville North Burlington for that terrific question. You know, colleagues, we are in uncertain times amid global economic uncertainty. She's absolutely correct. We know that people of Ontario are feeling those challenges. That is why we are maintaining a flexible plan and will continue in, to invest in the, building the critical infrastructure and services that people rely on, Mr. Speaker, like highways, education, public transit, schools, hospitals, and long-term care homes. Our government will always work to support people and businesses in these uncertain times, Mr. Speaker. For too long, we had a Liberal government that continued to impose new taxes upon new taxes, increasing the financial burdens on the people of Ontario. Spons? Our government's plan will build a stronger Ontario and put more money back into people's pockets and the hardworking people of this province. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that important answer. It is reassuring that our government has a robust plan, one that is flexible enough to deal with the current global economic uncertainty 
while ensuring that we continue to invest in the vital priorities of the people of this province. Speaker, Canada's Federal Minister of Finance, Christia Freeland, recently said that there will be difficult days ahead for Canada's economy. The Conference Board of Canada has also reported that Canada's economic output will slow to a near standstill over the next three quarters. Given the current and future concerns about economic uncertainty, what actions will our government and the Minister of, Fi of Finance take to continue to keep our province on a strong economic path? Good job. <laughs> Minister of Finance. Thank you again to the member from Oakville, North Burlington. That's a very important question. You know, the road ahead will not be easy in these uncertain times, Mr. Speaker. The global economy will continue to see growth slow in the near term. Governments will need to be agile with a responsible plan to respond to all challenges while, in, while acknowledging the risks of inflation. But, Mr. Speaker, I am confident in our province. I am confident in the resilience of the people of Ontario, and I am confident in our plan to build Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We have a strong plan to build infrastructure, train workers, and restore our manufacturing capacity while keeping costs down for people and businesses. Mr. Speaker, we have a strong plan for Ontario, and by being flexible and demonstrating restraint, we can overcome any challenge that comes our way. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Uh, in the last few days, I've heard from education workers who've expressed disappointment, they've expressed fear over the government's attack on their rights with the introduction of Bill 28. I heard from one constituent, Angela. She's an educational assistant. She's 60 years old. She works three jobs, and she can barely make ends meet. I want the Premier to know that parents support Angela, and they also are shocked at how little money she actually makes in her job. Uh, this Premier thinks that Angela and her colleagues uh, should lose their right to collective bargaining and continue struggling to support themselves and their families. This Premier also feels they should be content with a minimal increase that doesn't recognize historic inequities. Uh, this Premier also gave 88 per cent of his caucus a 13-plus pay increase with a stipend increase. Mr. Speaker, Question. will the government just admit just admit that instead of being for the people, they're really just here for themselves. Education. Mr. Speaker, we are for the students, which is why we brought forth the bill that ensures they're in class on Friday. And I would urge the member opposite to stand with the government in opposition to a strike that hurts every single constituent in our economy, in our society, and in all of our ridings. We have an obligation to these kids. What more do they have to be through until a responsible government, according to the NDP, actually stands up for their rights to learn? We need to ensure these kids have stability, continuity. A million parents depend on us today to get the job done, and to the families families who are urging the government to use every tool available to provide stability, they should be assured we will move forward with legislation. It is our intent to provide stability for the people we represent, Speaker. Supplementary question, Member for Waterloo. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it'll be a cold day in hell when we vote for a piece of legislation that tramples charter rights and human rights. If this Premier continues to drive education workers away from Ontario permanently, our kids will pay the price. We are actually seeing this happen in the health care sector. In the 2021 Economic Outlook and Fiscal Review, the Minister of Finance said, and I quote, for too long the workers of our province have been taken for granted. Take-home pay for many workers has not kept pace, uh, kept up with rising costs. He said this and continued by saying during the pandemic the workers of Ontario had our back and our government needs to have theirs. Mm. Well, these statements clearly need to be called into question, especially given Bill 28. The government also, and this is worth noting, question. this government has the money to respect workers in the education system by paying them fairly. You have the money. So why is it that the government said all the right things to workers just ahead of the election, but post-election, they've forgotten all of their principles, all of their morals, and all of your promises? Mr. Education. 
Mr. Speaker, the irony of the moral indignation of the NDP. This is a party in 1993 social contract actually legislated away 12 days of work, also known as the Ray Days. We'll take no lessons from the NDP in any way on this issue. Mr. Speaker, that's your record. The members seem to find it comical, not parents who are scrambling to find childcare today. You have a Order. choice. Vote for this bill, stand Order. with families, and ensure kids are in the classroom tomorrow, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government has shown contempt for the Charter of Rights and our Canada's Constitution, the highest law in this land. This government has shown contempt for legislation, Speaker, that is really bullying. This bill is a bully bill for the education workers, the frontline education workers, and the students that they support. Order. Speaker, this government has shown contempt for all of our government workers with Bill 124. The Premier and his minister has single-handedly created chaos in our education system and confusion for parents in our communities. Their heavy-handed approach is forcing an agreement upon QP workers, 55,000, 70 percent of whom are women, and they are the lowest paid workers in our education system. This is just the beginning Question. of negotiations. Speaker, can this Premier tell this House what does he have next for the other education workers, ETFO, OSSTF, all of the other education workers? What do you have in your back pocket for them? Minister of Education. Speaker, our commitment is to keep kids in the classroom. Although, Speaker, I am reminded order. by a statement, I am reminded by a statement from 2018 from the Liberal Party, who said, and I quote, "The NDP will let strikes carry on indefinitely because they'll never be willing to use back-to-work laws." What does this mean for York University students? End quote. Well, Mr. Speaker, could the Liberal Party of 2018 please stand up because we're using a back-to-work legislation to ensure kids are in school to provide stability for the children we all represent. Order. Mr. Speaker, we have an obligation to kids, and I'm going to move forward with legislation. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. President of the Treasury Board will come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the Premier and this minister are too weak to face education workers, Speaker. Instead, they are relying on using the notwithstanding clause the fundamental rights of all Canadians, Speaker, to negotiate instead of negotiating with education workers who are waiting right now at the table for this government to show up, Speaker. Why are they not doing their work? Instead, they are diminishing the collective rights of all Canadians. This is shameful. Come on, stand up. Do your work. Settle the agreements. As the former education minister, I settled nine agreements with all of our education tables. Order. With Government zero, side, come to order. zero disruption, it order. is possible. Why can't you do your work instead of introducing preemptive legislation? Preemptive legislation. These workers are Question. at the table right now. Where are you? Why are you not there? Why are you not giving them a fair offer? Why are you not proposing a fair deal to these workers? Member will take her seat. The member will take her seat. The government side will come to order. Minister of Education can reply. Mr. Speaker, it's not just QP that wants to close schools. The former Minister of Education closed 600 in the province of Ontario. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Restart the clock. We are investing more in public education than at any point in the history of Ontario. Stop the clock. 
Member for Scarborough, Guildwood will come to order. The President of the Treasury Board will come to order. The Minister for Infrastructure will come to order. <coughs> Start the clock. Minister of Education, please reply. Mr. Speaker, we insist kids are in the classroom, and I am urging the members of the Liberal Party, who themselves have used back-to-work legislation in this House, to stand with the government Ottawa, South, and work order. together to provide stability for our kids. Families in Scarborough, in Ottawa, in Toronto, and every region of this province deserve to be in school. It is the most vulnerable kids among us that pay the price. I am urging the members vote for this bill. Let's get kids back to class, Speaker. The member for Ottawa South is warned. The next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Recently in my community and surrounding area of Sault Ste. Marie, also known as Bawating, several events were held to commemorate the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. The Weekend for Truth and Reconciliation in Bawating was a two-day showcase of Indigenous arts, culture and heritage that were held in partnership between Indigenous Tourism Ontario and Chingwa Kinomagameg, which is an Indigenous institute in my riding. This event's overall success and benefits cannot be understated in recognizing truth and healing and creating a path forward. And one of these events showcased a special drone show that was used to illustrate a creation story about truth and reconciliation that was told by a local elder and former Ojibwe teacher of mine, Barbara Nolan, which she narrated in both Anishinaabemowin and English. Uh, Mr. Speaker, based on the success of this first time event in my riding, can we count on our government to continue to provide these significant investments for Indigenous events throughout Ontario? Thank you. I recognize uh, to reply the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. The member for Sault Ste. Marie raises a great point, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank him, and I'm happy to hear that the $185,000 provided to Indigenous tourism through our Reconnect Ontario program achieved the intended results. This weekend for the Weekend for Truth and Reconciliation in Sault Ste. Marie was one of the several Indigenous festivals and events we are supporting. This year, more than half a million dollars has been provided for events across Ontario. I agree with the CFO of Indigenous Tourism Ontario, who recently said, and I quote, Indigenous tourism is no longer an emerging market. It's one of the sectors consumers are demanding when they travel in and to Ontario. That's why we've invested $1.65 million since 2018 to Indigenous Tourism Ontario to create and encourage visits for operators Response. and jobs and business communities. We will not stop working towards our goals and working with them, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Right Supplementary question. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. Uh, Indigenous communities significantly contribute to Ontario's cultural, tourism, and economic landscape. Order. Seeing the success of the weekend for Order. truth and reconciliation in my riding of Sault Ste. Marie, Mr. Speaker, it is evident that there is a demand and an appreciation for Indigenous cultural tourism. Now, some of the things you could have enjoyed uh, over the weekend was shopping in an Indigenous vendor marketplace. You could have had some Indigenous food. You could have learned about Indigenous tourism experiences in Ontario and enjoyed some local Indigenous Indigenous music. You know, Mr. Speaker, since 2018, our government's focus on supporting Indigenous tourism has contributed to Indigenous cultural expression and preservation. Speaker, to the Minister, can you please detail what further investments our government is making towards creating jobs for Indigenous people and expanding tourism offerings across our great province of Ontario? Again, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you again for the question, uh, Mr. Speaker. Just last week, I was in Huntsville, where Destination Ontario signed an agreement with Indigenous Tourism Ontario at the Ontario Tourism Summit to work together in promoting Indigenous in tourism across our province. This partnership is an important milestone in supporting the growth of a sector that has contributed over $600 million of direct GDP and more than 10,000 full-year jobs to the economy in 2019. And just a few weeks before, I toured Manitoulin Island to announce the $300 to Indigenous Tourism Ontario through the Pan Regional Fund to support unique and authentic experiences in our province. 
ITO is extremely thankful for the fantastic contributions provided by the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport, ITO CEO and President said during the announcement. He noted, we couldn't continue our work to improve our socio-economic conditions of Indigenous people through tourism without your support. We will continue, as I said earlier, to show our support and act behind it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier, I've heard from an education assistant who is homeless. She's sleeping in her car and in homeless shelters. Education workers have experienced a 10 percent inflationary cut to their wages over the past decade, and your plan is to impose an additional 5 percent inflationary cut this year. Their pay is now so low that many cannot afford food, shelter and clothing for themselves or their children. Will your government ensure that our education workers are not forced to live on the streets or to access food banks? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, this government insists that kids are in the classroom. We believe it is so important that these kids are able to catch up. We've announced Ontario's plan to catch up, which includes the largest tutoring program, 7,000 more staff since we came to office, 1,800 more under our program. For that individual worker who we thank for her work in our schools, she should know that her pay will go up each and every year in the contract, 10 per cent over four years that she should know that her benefits will be maintained for her and her family, that her pension will continue to be indexed to inflation, unlike the majority of workers in this nation, Speaker. And I can confirm she will continue to have job security, which many people through the pandemic did not have. Speaker, we are committed to the workers of this province, but we also believe we have to stand up for our kids. And I wish the NDP would do the same, Speaker. Supplementary. The custodians at the Ontario French School Board make $18 an hour. I'm hearing from parents and students who want our education workers to make a living wage. Parents and students marched with our education workers Tuesday at Queen's Park to demand that the government return to the negotiating table, and, and they will be marching with us on Friday to demand that this government make a, give these workers a living wage. Parents and students are angry that you are stripping Ontarians of their charter rights. They are demanding that you get back to the negotiating table so that there's no disruption to our education system and that our workers, the people who serve our children every day, are making enough money to pay for the basics. Will you do that? Remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor. The House Minister of Education. Speaker, we will ensure kids are in the classroom. That is the obligation we made to the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I want to read a message from Ian, from my colleague, from the member from Burlington. And Ian said, I just want to thank you for your government for introducing Bill 28. The kids have had enough disruption in their education over the past three years, and I'm very happy to see the Ford government standing up to the QP. Please continue to advocate for the kids of Ontario, end quote. Mr. Speaker, these are the voices we are hearing from parents, those that are desperate to see their kids get back on track, desperate to see them have the social, emotional interaction, the learning, the mental and health benefits that come with our schools. And so, Speaker, we're moving forward with the bill. Uh, regrettably as it is that we're in this place in the first place because we presented CUPE with a path to a voluntary settlement. They refuse. They insist on a strike, and therefore the government will bring forth and move forward with this legislation that provides stability for the people Order. of this province. Speaker. Right. The next question, the member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for Solicitor General. My constituents are concerned about the reports of increasing crime in the region of Peel and across this province. Peel is a great place to live with vibrant communities, friendly neighborhood, and positive economic growth and development. Peel is the place for hardworking people. However, my constituents in the riding of Mississauga Malton are seeing an increase in violence and crime in their neighborhood. Mr. Speaker, our government has a strong record of supporting the police and cracking down on crime, but clearly more need to be done, especially in the light of the recent events. So, Speaker, my question to Solicitor General, please explain how our government and local police services are tackling crime in the communities like Mississauga Malta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To reply, the Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Mississauga Malton for his question. Mr. Le Président, 200 Mr. Speaker, 
everyone has the right to feel safe while they go about their life. Connection to what's happening in Peel, because I've been there, and I've seen for myself. I've been to Division 11, that responded to Constable Andrew Hong's tragedy call. I've been to the 911 call center and met with the operators there. And I want to recognize the leadership of Peel. And we know that our brave men and women that serve in services across Ontario, but particularly in Peel, have made a massive sacrifice to serve. And we thank them. And we will always have their backs. And they can depend on our Premier and our government today and every day. Monsieur le Président, Mr. Speak, today and every day. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to say thank you to Solicitor General for your response. Someone who believes in service over self. As previously stated, our government supports police across the province, and we thank them for their service in our communities every day. Mr. Speaker, it is reported that Peel Police conducted an extensive investigation into a Canada-US smuggling ring that resulted in the seizure of a large quantity of illegal drugs. The dedicated officers of Peel Region Police, some who are here as well, are deserving our thanks and gratitude for ongoing support in our region, and especially for their recent successful operation. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, we'll appreciate if you can provide the details on excellent work done by Peel Police Services in securing the largest drug bust in the history. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Solicitor General. From Mississauga Malton, Peel Regional Police Specialized Enforcement Bureau, through funding provided by the Ontario government, were involved in an 11-month investigation involving an international drug trafficking enterprise. And through this project, Peel Regional Police seized more than $25 million worth of narcotics from a criminal group that used commercial trucks to smuggle drugs across the border. And I'd like to give credit to the Deputy Chief and Detective Sergeant who are with us today. hear how joint operations can be so effective to keep everyone safe. Monsieur le Président, just Mr. Speaker, I'm so happy to support policemen and all that ensure the security of Ontario every day. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I want to bring up a story of an education assistant in Niagara, Michelle Branch. Michelle knew she was never going to be rich doing what she does. She said as a university and college educated single mother, she thought she could do this work and provide more for her family, help pay for her mortgage, insurance, groceries, and all the things her daughter needs. This is a female dominated workplace. And once again, like the nurses and the healthcare workers before this, this government is continuing to keep women down. Will the Premier answer why this government is refusing to bargain in good faith with education workers and passionate education workers that are struggling to make ends meet? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to getting kids, keeping them in class, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, to the rhetoric from the members opposite, we never left the bargaining table. We've been before the union for the past several days. The only thing that hasn't Order. changed, the intransigence of the union for not withdrawing the strike on Friday. Order. Not one time for the Order. record state has a Liberal or New Democrat asked the union to withdraw the strike on two million kids. Like, Am I the only one? Are we the only ones who are somewhat concerned with the impact on kids? I guess we are, because I find that quite troubling that only progressive conservatives are standing up to ensure kids are in school. I am urging the members of the interest of children first. Vote for this bill. Let's make sure kids are in school. Speaker. Spadina, Fort York, come to order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The interests of my grandson 
is in front of my mind and within this, this side of the house for clean, safe schools. Not ordering back. I have been sent pay stub after pay stub after pay stub from education workers this week. The vast majority of them are making barely over a minimum wage. I hear about veteran education work, workers of, of 30 years having to watch their colleagues finish their work at school and then go to McDonald's for a night shift. Melanie O'Neill is an EA and a parent and knows the value of the need for staff, qualified, professional, skilled and experienced staff who feel valued and motivated to their jobs and who will stay long term. Premier, given the fact that you are willing to table this massive bill to trample the rights of education workers, where you were you ever really bargaining in good faith for Question. parents and the staffs that make our schools work and keep our children safe and our classrooms clean? Mr. Of education. Mr. Speaker, it was our government that got nine voluntary agreements with every single education union just three years ago. But, Mr. Speaker, what I will note is a quote from Larry from London, a retired educator, a vice principal, who said, the students have already lost so much over the past two and a half years. Lost education, effects on their mental health. Send a message to the unions, the kids belong. Opposition in come to order. We firmly agree with this former educator who himself has seen the adverse impacts of disruption. And so, in response to the union's decision to proceed with the strike, the government Member brought forth Sudbury legislation to, to avert the strike to keep kids in school where we believe they belong, Speaker. The next question, the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. The prevalence of gender-based and sexual violence on university and college campuses is disturbing and upsetting. I know we can all agree students attending colleges and universities across this province should not be victims of sexual violence and harassment. The overall safety of students should be the top priority of our educational institutions and our government. We must ensure students attending college or university in London or anywhere across this province feel safe and supported. Speaker, can the Minister of Colleges and Universities share with the House how our government's proposed legislation, Bill 26, will strengthen protection for students from gender-based and sexual violence and how this legislation will improve campus safety? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for such an important question. Our government has a zero-tolerance policy for any form of sexual violence and harassment. And as a mother of three post-secondary age daughters, I know firsthand the feeling as a parent of wanting your kids to enjoy everything the post-secondary education journey has to offer while still worrying about their safety and their well-being. One of the first actions I took as Minister of Colleges and Universities was to participate in sector-wide consultations to determine how, as a sector, we could better address instances of sexual violence on campus. What we heard across the board is that we need to find ways to not only empower survivors, but also deal with the issues surrounding the prevalence of power dynamics and secrecy in many instances of sexual violence. If passed, Bill 26 will tackle just that. It will prevent any instances of sexual violence committed by a faculty or staff Response. member to go unreported and prevent those who commit acts of sexual violence to move from one institution to the next under the protection of non-disclosure agreements. I look forward to Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The minister just explained how Bill 26 would provide measures for post-secondary institutions to address faculty and staff sexual abuse towards students. The provisions of Bill 26 are necessary steps and will have a meaningful impact on ensuring the cases of sexual violence do not go unreported. While we know that there are faculty and staff who do incredible work at our local colleges and universities, it is clear that Bill 26 is intended to strengthen measures to protect our students. Speaker, can the minister tell the House how this bill will help protect students in cases of faculty and staff sexual misconduct? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member raises an incredibly important point. Ontario colleges and universities have incredible faculty and staff that not only help to carry our sector through the pandemic, but day in and day out are finding ways to make our sector even better. 
As Minister, I've had the opportunity to meet with countless faculty and staff at institutions across the province. I am so grateful for the work that they do. And in speaking with many of those faculty and staff members, the changes we are proposing in Bill 26 are long overdue and desperately needed in the sector. Specifically, these changes would give institutions stronger tools to address instances of faculty or staff sexual misconduct against students, prevent the use of, use of non-disclosure agreements, and further require institutions to have sexual misconduct policies in place. Speaker, our government will always do what is necessary to keep the people of Ontario safe. Thank you. And as a minister and mother, I encourage members of our faculty and staff across the post-secondary sector to stand with me and our government to make sure that students are safe here, on here. campuses. Here, here. The next question, the member for Kiwetnong. Uh, speaker, good morning. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Uh, next week um, is Treaties Recognition Week in Ontario. Uh, treaty rights our rights set out in the treaty agreement. These treaty rights are recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act. They define the specific rights, benefits, obligations of the signatories. In my writing, I see boy water advisories. In my writing, I see young people, 11 years old, dying by suicide. What work is Ontario doing to uphold their treaty right, treaty obligations? The Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member uh, for his question. It is an important point. There are more than 40 uh, treaties of adhesion that cover the province of Ontario. Uh, in the past and present day. We have a responsibility, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that the people of Ontario, through Treaties Recognition Week, have an opportunity to access, access information that will help better inform them the lands that they're living on. For our purposes, Mr. Speaker, the government takes this responsibility very seriously. And over the course of next week, as my learned colleague uh, had said uh, uh, just uh, uh, moments ago, uh, that there are events across the province that will uh, bring and draw attention to this, Mr. Speaker. In the meantime, we will remain focused as a, a, as a government on ensuring Bonds. that these treaties are honoured and respected, Mr. Speaker, and, and carried out as they should be. The supplementary. Speaker, uh, this government thinks nothing of trampling on the rights of all people. I think a lot about uh, the progress Ontario is making towards honouring treaty rights. And when I see, see it used and not withstanding clause, when I see the substandard housing, when I see the boil water advisories I mentioned before, when I see the lack of education, uh, school, like uh, schools, and resources in our nations. That says a lot to me. One way Ontario can honour its treaty obligations is by dropping its appeal of the Robinson-Huron annuities ruling. Will Ontario drop the annuity? Appeal. <laughs> I will speak directly to the matter, Mr. Speaker, because it is uh, before the courts, but I can say that there have been uh, fruitful conversations, Mr. Speaker, with respect to just about every treaty in this province when it comes to disputed land claims and flooding claims. Since 2018, under the leadership uh, of our Premier, Mr. Speaker, he's made a clear commitment to ensure that these claims that cover treaties are settled, Mr. Speaker. In the context of reconciliation, this is giving communities and community members an opportunity to move on. To, to actually experience the kind of prosperity that many Ontarians have taken for granted. For far too long, Mr. Speaker, uh, Indigenous communities have been held back by this. So honouring the treaties and moving beyond those treaties to ensure that communities are involved in things like forest management, management plans, the incredible opportunities in the Ring of Fire, the opportunity, Mr. Speaker, for a young Indigenous person to have a clear path That's... towards a job 
Mr. Speaker, for a better set of economic circumstances for them, their families, and their communities is a top priority. Thank you. Next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Last month, in my riding of Peterborough Kawartha, our government participated in the Lighted Up event to help raise awareness for National Disabilities Employment Awareness Month by lighting up the Service Ontario building in blue and purple. This annual event comes at a time when many employers across Ontario and across all of Canada are in fierce competition to secure the best talent. With so many job vacancies throughout the province, employers benefit greatly from a diverse workforce. Speaker, could the minister please explain to the House why raising awareness in support of National Disability Employment Awareness Month is crucial, and what actions will our government take towards making Ontario open and inclusive for everyone? Mm -hmm. Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you to the hardworking member from Peterborough for asking such an important question. Our government is committed to removing barriers to employment for people with disabilities and connecting job seekers and employers. Mr. Speaker, October was a National Disability Employment Awareness Month, also known as NDM. Mr. Speaker, people with disabilities represent a large talent pool of skilled workers, and they are ready to make a difference in Ontario workplaces. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. A commitment to accessibility awareness doesn't just stop with recognizing the importance of National Disability Employment Month. People in my riding want good-paying jobs regardless of their backgrounds, and when employers focus on an individual's strength first, they can find great employees. Here, here. Speaker, could the minister please tell the House what our government is doing to support employment opportunities for people with disabilities in my riding of Peterborough, Kawartha, across Ontario, and how is our government making investments that will help create inclusive opportunities for all Ontarians? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for another good question. Our government is dedicated to helping create society that is more inclusive for everyone, especially people with disabilities and older Ontarians like me. <laughs> the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development has invested an additional $90 million into the Skills Development Fund. This fund supports projects that prepare job seekers for meaningful careers. Response? We will continue to engage with the employers and partners to promote the benefits of hiring people with disabilities to improve the culture of employment in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.